What are your thoughts about um, the efforts of Elon Musk and SpaceX and pushing this commercial space flight and I mean other companies, Axiom Space as well? Uh, what are your thoughts on um, on their efforts? It's like a gold rush. Uh, it's a, a space race 2.0. There's a lot of terms for it. The new space race, I think it's fabulous. I think it is, it's moving at a pace that is unprecedented. And, and also there's a lot of, there's an investment from the commercial and private sector pushing it forward. So Elon most notoriously doing a lot of it just himself with SpaceX. So we've worked really closely with the SpaceX ops teams and medical team uh, planning the Inspiration4 mission and now some of the Polaris missions which are happening. And Jared Isaacman, has been a fabulous colleague, collaborator, pilot for the missions. You know, we're doing, again, we're doing the same deep profiling and molecular characterization of these astronauts as we've done for uh, Scott Kelly and other astronauts that are from NASA. And we're seeing so far, actually, there'll be a lot of this presented later this year. It seems like uh, it's pretty safe. Again, there's dangers. We can see real stress on the body, very obvious changes, some of the same uh, changes that Scott Kelly experienced. But for the most part, they return back to normal, even for a short three-day mission, uh, I remember I was chatting with, with Jared and, he, and we were presenting the data to them actually just a few weeks ago, kind of a, a briefing to the crew. And because they went to 590 kilometers, they went basically several hundred kilometers higher than the space station or the Hubble you normally rest. So more radiation, you know, the farther you get from Earth, there's more radiation. He was worried, you know, did we get cooked? It was kind of his question for me in the briefing. And I said, well, actually it looks like you can go back into the microwave. You didn't get fully cooked. You can go a little bit farther. So for the Polaris mission, they're going to go even farther uh, and then also uh, open the hatch and go out in these new spacesuits that SpaceX is designing. Mm -hmm. That'll be much nimbler, not as much of a giant, you know, uh, Dr. Octagon kind of uh, spacesuit, but really um, that, like, looks like just a nice spacesuit. And they're going to go out into the vacuum of space. And so, you know, pushing all the engineering uh, for these missions, which are privately funded. So it's, it's people who just say, I want to go up in space and see if I can push the limits has been fabulous, but I think the most fabulous part is, is Jared in particular, but others, other commercial spaceflight drivers like John Schaffner, Peggy Whitson for the Axiom missions are coming to us, to scientists, researchers saying, I don't just wanna go up into space just to hang out. How much science can I get done when I'm up there? What can I do? What experiments can I do? Give me you know, blood, tissue, urine, uh, semen, tears, I'll give you any biofluid. <laughs> uh, you know, and I, I always I email them back and say, listen, every one of your cells is worthy of study. I send, send me, you know, so I, I have this really kind of creepy geneticist email response, yeah. <laughs> like I want all of your cells, you know, but but it's true because there's so much yeah. we don't know. I want to learn as much as we can about it. every every time I go up anyone. So we're doing it, you know, with NASA astronauts, but it's been suddenly this influx of new crews that are willing to do almost anything, right? So including, we did skin biopsies for the Inspiration4 crew before and after space flight. And that's never been done before. We've never seen the structure of the skin and how it changes in response to microgravity and also the microbes that change. And so with these beautiful images of uh, even the structure of skin changing and the inflammation that we've seen in like for Scott Kelly, for example, we now have a molecule by molecule map of what happens to skin, which has never been done before. So there- What are interesting surprises there? So one of the interesting things we can see, the part of what's driving inflammation is we can actually see macrophages and there's other dendritic cells, pieces like cells that are part of the immune system kind of creeping along towards the surface of the skin, which is now we know it's actually physically driving the immune system is these cells going and creating this inflammation, which is what leads to some of the rashes. But we didn't see as much in them as we saw, for example, some of the signatures of Scott Kelly. So uh, we can see within the crew who's getting more of a rash or not, or who didn't experience any rash. And some people had... Uh, changes in vision. Some people had, you know, other uh, GI problems. Uh, even, you know, even looking at sort of what happens to the gut and looking at the microbiome of the gut, other people didn't. So we are able to see and start to get a little bit predictive about our medicine. Right now, we're just diagnosing, but it'd be good to say, uh, if you're going into space, here's exactly what you need for each bacteria in your body. Here's what you could maybe take to get rid of nausea or other ways we could monitor you to keep keep the inflammation down. What does it take to prepare for one of these missions? Because you mentioned some of the folks are not necessarily lifelong astronauts. You're talking about more and more regular civilians. What's What does it take physiologically and psychologically to prepare for these? They have to do a lot of the same training that most astronauts do. So a lot of it's done in Hawthorne at SpaceX headquarters, which if you can ever get a chance to do a tour, is fabulous. It's really, you can see all these giant rockets being built and then we're drawing blood over there right next to them. So it's a really cool place. But the the training, they have to go through a lot of the ops, a lot of the programming just in case. Most of the systems are automated on the Dragon and other spacecraft, but just in case. So they have to go through all the majority of the training. If you want to go to the space station as the Axiom missions are, uh, including John Schroffner, you have to do training for some of the Russian modules. 
And if you don't do that training, then you're not allowed to go to the Russian part of the space station, apparently. So right now, John Schaffner, for example, unless he completes this additional training all in Russian, he's not allowed- All in Russian? Otherwise, you know, to learn enough Russian to be, you know, just wow. functional. Wow. So it's not just technical, you also have to- learn Enough, enough Russian. Enough, yeah, enough yeah. Russian. And uh, so, it's a, and if he doesn't learn, he can't go to that part of the space station. So interesting things like that. Are, but you'll be, you know, it's not that far. You're like, oh, I can see it right there. I can't float over to that that capsule. Uh, but technically, he can't go. So you know, is there um, a Chinese component to this, the International Space Station? Is there collaboration there? Sadly, not. They're building uh, their own space station. Uh, I'm glad they're building a space station. Actually, eventually, there'll be probably four space stations in orbit by 2028. Uh, some from the orbital reef, some from Lockheed Martin. Of course, Axiom is is far ahead right now. They're probably going to be done first. But the the extraordinary thing is, uh, th there's. Unfortunately, there's no collaboration between the- You see that as a negative, that's not the positive kind of competition. Well, it's it's good, good question. So maybe, uh, for example, when we get different NASA grants, you apply for a grant, you get it to the lab, it goes you know, to go through Cornell, the grants office. I have to sign it as a scientist, as the PI on the, on the mission, say, I promise I will move no funds or resources or any staff to anyone in China or work with anyone in China yeah. with these dollars that you're giving to the lab for this mission. And so the, every other grant I get from the uh, NASA, DOD, or sorry, do you, let me go back to that. Every other grant I get from, say, the NIH or the NSF, even sometimes DOD, you don't have to promise that you won't talk to anybody in China about it. But the, for NASA alone, it's congressionally mandated. You have to promise and sign all this paperwork that I can't do anything with anyone in China about this. And I, what I view as sad about that is I want to at least be able to chat with them about it and know yeah. what they're up to. But we can't, you know, even go to a conference in China, technically with NASA funds about say space medicine or engineering a new rocket. I, I, I can't go, I could go with personal funds, but I can't use those funds. Like you should be able to go to a conference and in a friendly way, talk shit yeah. to the other scientists. Yeah. Yeah, like yeah. we're doing, like like the way scientists do really well, which is like they compliment, but it's a backhanded compliment. <laughs> like, uh, like you're doing a really good job here. And then you mm -hmm. kind of imply that you're doing a much better job. That's the core of competition. Yep. You get jealous and then you, everybody's yeah, trying kinda, to yeah, prove. Yeah but that you're ultimately talking, you're ultimately collaborating closely, you're competing closely, yeah. as opposed to in your own silos. 